We are, we are going to begin this new series today, I Am the Impact, and if you take notes for sermons, and you should, the title of this message is An Unreserved Yes. An Unreserved Yes. And I want to kind of tell you the background of, of why I wanted to preach on this today. I, I am uh, fascinated with history. I'm not a fan of math, uh, nothing against math other than the fact that it's a satanic tool of the devil <laughs> to destroy the universe. Okay, I may have crossed the line right there. I bet we got a math teacher looking for a calculus book to throw at me. Um, <laughs> oh, you're pointing to her? Bless in Jesus' name. Just bless her, Lord. Um, <laughs> so, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, math. If you do all the math problems, you know they all wind up with the same answer, right? 666. Six, six. <laughs> so, um, I'm just joking. I don't really hate math. I just don't get it. But... Um, I love history, and when I became a Christian, I became a Christian 25 years ago, and I started um, becoming fascinated with the history of the Bible. And, you know, critics and skeptics and uh, agnostics and, and many people will say, can't believe the Bible, the Bible's full of errors, the Bible's not true. And, and you know, when people say that, honestly, they have no idea what they're talking about. And they haven't done their homework. And they haven't done the research, and they haven't read um, even recently, within the last several weeks, there have been archaeological finds that have validated historical um, uh, things in the Bible that people up until now had said, see, there's no historical evidence to validate that. So I've just become fascinated with the history of the Bible in the days of Christ, and I've done several study tours of the Middle East, Israel, Egypt, Turkey, and Greece. And when I was in Israel uh, leading a team from Liberty University, uh, my wife and I led a, a team of students over there. And even prior to that, I became fascinated with the time period in which Jesus lived. And this passage I'm going to read to you is hopefully going to illuminate our hearts and minds to this idea that when you say yes to Jesus, you've got to say yes to Jesus more than once. And I am an evangelist, so I do call people to repent. I, I give invitations. I'm old school. I do it Billy Graham style. I believe that you say yes to Jesus and you are saved right there on the spot. But I also believe that you continue to be saved for the rest of your life. That salvation is not a one and done event. That salvation is like a child being born. You're not alive until you're born, but you don't start living until the birth happens. That's like saying yes to Jesus. When we say yes to Jesus that initial time, we say, Jesus, you're Lord, I'm not. I'm a sinner, you're the perfect Savior. I want to give control of my life to you. Yes, Lord, you can have my life, my sin, my regrets. You can have my past, you can have my future. You can have my money, my thoughts, my relationships. Jesus, I'm all yours. And, and like a poker player uh, on, on, on television at the big Texas Hold'em tournament, you slot all your chips to the middle of the table. Jesus, I'm all yours and I'm all in. That's what it means to say yes to Jesus. But like a child who is born, life doesn't begin until birth, but life continues for 75, 80, 90, maybe 100 years after birth, that is how salvation works. We call that discipleship. We say yes to Jesus, but we keep on saying yes to Jesus every minute of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year, of every decade for the rest of our lives. We have to keep saying yes to Jesus. And we can't hedge our bets. We can't hold our cards up to our chest to see what we've got. We have to lay them all down. It's yes, Jesus. I don't even care what the question is. It's yes, wherever you want me to go, whatever you want me to do, whatever sacrifice I need to make, whatever price I need to pay. You want my money? It's yours. You want that extra car in the garage we almost never use? It's yours. You want us to give up the, the guest bedroom that nobody ever goes into so a single mom who has no husband and is raising two kids, working three jobs, barely scraping by, you want us to let her and her family move in? Sure, our house is yours. You want me to give you this bad relationship because I'm dating a psycho Billy ninja on crack and he treats me like trash? You want me to give that up? Yes, Jesus, I give it up. That's what it means to always say yes to Jesus. But what I want to say today is very simply this. When you give Jesus an irreversible, irrevocable, unreserved yes, you really don't know where that's going to take you. 
Now, we know eventually where it takes us. Heaven. I'm looking forward to that. Six weeks ago, my dad went to heaven. A year and a half ago, my mom went to heaven. I'm looking forward to heaven. I'm looking forward to streets of gold, and I'm looking forward to barbecue buffet lines that never end, and I'm looking forward to playing a pickup game with Michael Jordan in his prime, and Jesus, I want to dunk on Jordan. It's my dream. Um, I, I want to I really dunk on Kobe because I get sick of people saying Kobe's as good as Michael. No, he's not, but I digress. Uh, I wanna, I'm looking forward to heaven. But we know that's ultimately, if you're a Christian, ultimately that's where we wind up. In the presence of God, eternally giving glory and honor and worship to Jesus Christ. But between the yes and the end, there's an unknown. We have to trust Jesus enough to say yes. Because we really don't know where that unknown is going to lead us. Between the promise and the payoff, there's a process. And the process is the point. We all want to think about the payoff being the point. Can't wait till I get to heaven. But the point is not the payoff. The point is the process. So Jesus makes a promise. We look forward to the payoff. But in the meantime, there's a process. And if you miss the process, you miss the point. The point is, say yes to Jesus throughout the process. Continue to say yes. Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. I'll explain a little bit more of the historical context to you at the end of the message. Let's dive in. He, Jesus, then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, but Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Let's pause for a moment. Uh, I love being a Christian for lots of reasons. I'm not going to hell. That's, that's awesome. Um, I get to know Jesus. I get all the blessings of, of being his child. I'm adopted into his family. But I really like being a Christian because if you read the Gospels, you realize this. Jesus loves stupid people. And I'm stupid. Jesus loves idiots. Jesus loves arrogant, proud, pompous hotheads like me and Peter. Jesus is like, okay, let me tell you guys one more time. I'm going to die. It gives me great encouragement to know that you can be the impact in your world because if Jesus could use these 12 bozos to change the world, he can, he can use anybody. Jesus is always saying, the Son of Man has come to give his life. I will lay down my life. I'll be taken up by the hands of sinners, and I'm going to die. And every time he does that, the disciples are like, what are you talking about? We do not understand. Jesus talks about being the bread of life. And they look around and go, we don't see any bread. And Jesus is like, ah! Like, I just, I, I love the fact that over and over in the Bible, Jesus goes out to a quiet place to pray. I know why he did that, because he's surrounded by crazy people that don't listen. <laughs> See, the disciples were following Jesus, and, and they, they loved him, but they were also saying yes to Jesus for what they could get out of it. Now, don't get me wrong. We get a lot out of this deal. We get a lot, eternal life, forgiveness of sin, salvation, right relationships with brothers and sisters, godly marriages, the freedom to give away our money and not be a slave to success, the ability to belong to the kingdom of God and to associate with Jesus more than we do a political party, Republican or Democrat, a country, America, Uzbekistan, Mongolia. We are in the kingdom of God now. We belong to him. We get a lot of great stuff out of it, but I'm really wondering if when we say yes to Jesus, we're not a lot like the disciples because the disciples were all in it for what they could get out of it too. Now later on, they'll understand more what it means to be a disciple. But the reason why Peter rebukes Jesus is because Peter was a typical Jewish man in the first century. Let me explain what I mean. Peter came from Galilee. Pastor Pete was just there. I was just there recently as well. Galilee is in the northern regions of Israel. Galilee... Uh, in those days was a hotbed of Jewish nationalism. The men who lived in Galilee during the days of Jesus liked to consider themselves or call themselves zealots. 
Now, I don't think I have to explain to you what a zealot is because this is Lexington, Kentucky. You know what a zealot is. A zealot is a fan. A zealot is somebody who is obsessed. A zealot is somebody that yells and screams and cheers for their favorite team. A zealot is somebody that goes to the UK playoff game. He takes his shirt off. He paints his chest blue, his face blue. He, 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 he has a pet wildcat on a leash, I mean, okay? That's a zealot. That's a zealot. Okay, now, now we're connected. Now we're relating to each other. But in the days of Jesus, Israel had been overtaken by an occupying military force. There was an empire that ruled the world back then, the Roman Empire, governed by Caesar, Caesar Augustus, Julius Caesar, Diocletian, Vespasian, Domitian. Some of these guys were really bad, like Nero. And, and the Roman Empire had invaded Israel, they had begun to collect taxes from the Jews, they had put their military and police force all throughout the region, and they had anchored their empire, their little empire's outpost in the holy city of Jerusalem. Well, a uh, hundred miles away from Jerusalem, actually less than a hundred miles away from Jerusalem, in Galilee, far away from the Roman empire's outpost, these zealots, like Peter, and most of the disciples prayed and planned and plotted and prepared ways to kill Romans. Just hated them. They, they, they longed for the day that God would restore the glory of the kingdom of David, that he would rebuild the temple, that he would rebuild the Holy of Holies, that maybe even the Ark of the Covenant would come back. That was every Jew's dream, get rid of the pagan Roman occupying force so that we can have God's kingdom here among us again. And make no mistake about it, the disciples who followed Jesus, though they did indeed love him and they did believe he was Messiah, they also struggled with selfish desires because I believe Peter's thinking, now that we've met the Messiah, this guy can raise dead people. This guy can cast demons out of people. This guy can curse fig trees and they wither and die. This guy can turn water into wine. This guy is really legit, too legit to quit. Hey, hey, a little MC Hammer never hurt anybody in a sermon. Okay, three people know who MC Hammer was. Thank you. I guess I need to quote some country music. <laughs> All right, I'm going to back up and start over. That they're thinking if we follow Jesus, Jesus is going to kick the Romans out, destroy the Roman Empire, and we, his 12 disciples, will be his senior staff. We'll get to... You know, all the great positions of prominence. I'll get to be his secretary of state. Peter's probably thinking, make me your minister of defense. You know, because Peter cuts off the guy's ear in the garden, right? Peter carried a sword. That's why we know Peter was a zealot, because zealots always carried short scabbards with them everywhere they went and they're thinking okay what's in it for us I'll be your vice president I'll be your prime minister I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna get to be in your senior staff Jesus when you bring the thunder and you kill all the Romans and you bring back the glory of God to Israel so when Jesus says uh, hey guys in case you forgot when you said yes to me you gave me control there's a cross in my future the Son of Man's going to die. And Peter's like, now hold on, Jesus. i got to hand it to Peter. Peter had guts. He had a disease. Big mouth, little brain disease. Any of you have that? Any of you married to a man with that? Big brain, little mouth disease. Talk before you think. Peter rebukes Jesus, but Jesus is not one bit intimidated by Peter. I, I love this. He rebukes the Lord. And then verse 33 says... But then Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, and he rebuked Peter. I love Jesus for lots of reasons. Here's one. Sometimes he just says it like it is. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Now, I love 
the Jesus, Jesus, meek and mild Jesus. I love the loving Jesus in the pictures, the Norwegian, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, pasty-skinned Jesus. I love the Jesus who carries lambs around on his shoulders. I love that, you know, pick you up when you're on the ground, that the grace, mercy, loving, gentle, patient Jesus. And I'm thankful for that Jesus. But that kind of Jesus alone doesn't have the power or authority to save anybody from anything. I also like the big bad Jesus who says, hey everybody, I'm God. Want me to prove it? I made air. <laughs> Try breathing without it. Go. <laughs> Like, I like the fact that Jesus has authority. I like the fact that Jesus can whoop the devil's tail. I like it that Jesus is not afraid of death. I like it that Jesus was strong enough to defeat the grave. I like it that Jesus stands up to Peter and says, you will not tempt me. You hush your mouth, Peter. I love you, but you are letting Satan speak through you to me. Do not tempt me to walk away from my destiny. My destiny is to keep saying yes to my Heavenly Father's will. And my Heavenly Father's will is that I die on the cross to save people from their sins. So, Peter, do not let the devil use you to tempt me to walk away from my destiny. That's what Peter hears Jesus say. He wasn't possessed by a demon. He was simply talking like someone who doesn't think like God wants them to think. They think like the world wants them to think. And this is where the story takes a very dramatic turn. Verse 34. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples. So Jesus is not just talking to the elect that he's handpicked to go around with him to do ministry. He's also talking to the crowd. And let me just say, uh, for those of you that are into theology, you care about doctrine, and there are some people that really love that stuff. I did. I do. I want to just point out to you that in verse 34, Jesus is talking to everybody because Jesus loves everybody, because Jesus cares about everybody. And I want to go on record and let you know that Jesus cares about you. You don't need to worry, am I elect? Am I one of the hand-picked? Am I one of the chosen? You are made in the image of God. And 2 Peter 3, 9 says it's not God's will that anyone should perish, but that everyone should come to repentance. And Jesus himself, out of his own mouth, said to Nicodemus in the third chapter of John, the 16th verse, that God loved the whole world, the cosmos, so much that he gave his only son so that anyone who put their faith in him would not have to perish and die, but have everlasting life. Jesus is concerned about the crowd. And he calls the crowd and his disciples, and he says something that is so scandalous that I don't think any of us in here could possibly understand. He says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, I may read the rest of the text in a few minutes, but I want to stop right there because there are some things I want to say, especially as we begin this new series, I Am the Impact. I'd like for you to write some of this down. Here's a big idea big idea from this passage and the big idea of this series. If you want to make a difference, stop talking and take up your cross. If you want to make a difference, stop talking and start taking. Start taking chances. Start taking risks. Start taking Jesus seriously. Stop talking and start taking God at his word. If you want to make a difference, if you want to make an impact, stop praying for God to use somebody else to make an impact and start being the impact. If you want to make a difference on your college campus, then quit praying for 14 other people to join you in this vision you have for a campus ministry and do it. They'll follow you. You know, people are born and wired to follow leaders. The reason why a lot of stuff doesn't get done is because no one will step up and lead. Lead. Be the impact. Take a risk. Take a chance. Stop praying for God to inspire one of your friends to give $10,000 to plant a church in a foreign country when you know good and well that you've got $10,000 saved up somewhere, stored away in a checking account or a savings account, and you haven't touched it, and you don't need it, and you could just as easily give it as you could pray about it. Ooh, I'm, I'm preaching to somebody right now. See, a pastor's job is not to tell you what you want to hear. A pastor's job is to tell you what you need to hear. And I'm not one bit 
worried about trying to be cool or popular. I'm not running for office. I'm not up for election. I'm not trying to be cool. I'm not cool. I'm 39. I go to bed at 9 o'clock. I watch reruns of Matlock. You think I care about being cool? Here's a real deal. We need to stop talking about making a difference, and we need to be the impact ourselves. And so Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, I know you guys are all thinking that one day soon it's going to be all perfect. You're looking at it through rose-colored glasses. You can't wait until it's like, you know, following Jesus is like a weekend at the spa. It's like a night at the Ritz. It's the best food. It's, a, it's, the, it's the manicure and the pedicure and the full-body massage. And it's, and, it's, and it's angels plucking on harps and, and being fanned with peacock feathers and fed grapes. And Jesus is like, guys, I know that in your mind you think I'm going to give that to you. But know this, know this, following me will lead you to the cross. And the cross is not a decoration. The cross is an execution. I need to say that again. The cross is not a decoration. The cross is an execution. Now, write this down. Number one, there's always a cost in following Jesus. There's always a cost in following Jesus. I've got two books with me. I've written seven books. I brought two of them with me today, and, and after the service, I'll, I'll be at the source. Love to sign a book for you. Shake your hand if you want to buy one or if you want to buy both of them. But one of the books that I've written is a book called Amazing Encounters. And over the years, I've just heard people say, I struggle having a quiet time. I struggle discerning God's will. I struggle hearing God's voice. And so I wrote a book. It's, it's in the form of a devotional. And every chapter has a real live story about someone I've met or something I've experienced or something that you can sink your teeth into to keep your attention, to help you hear God's voice and see God's activity and make wise decisions based on God's leadership. And one of the stories in the book illustrates this first point, that there's always a cost to following Jesus. And it's about a friend of mine in Jamaica named Mark. I'd been a Christian about four years. I was 18. I was getting ready to enter college. And my first international mission trip, I went to Jamaica. And all day long, every day from 7 a.m. until you know late afternoon, uh, myself and some of my friends and two Jamaicans, Mark and Garfield, we would shovel concrete, we would mix concrete by hand. Um, sand, concrete mix, gravel, and water. And we would mix that stuff back breaking work all day, every day, and then we would go take a shower, and then I would go back and preach. And sometimes they'd, I would preach like three sermons. I would preach one, think I was done, they'd sing, bring me back up, exhausted. So towards the end of the week, Mark... My Jamaican friend responded to the gospel, and he gave his life to Christ, and he prayed, and I talked to him, and he's crying. He says, please pray for me, Clayton. I'll never forget it in that Jamaican accent. He said, I'm going home to tell my father about Jesus, man. My father is a Rasta. His dad was a Rastafarian. And he said, my father would not like this, and so we prayed for him, and the next morning we got up, and we went over to the church we were building, and... We all start shoveling gravel and concrete. Mark never showed up. After lunch, Garfield went to look for him, couldn't find him. That night, I uh, got dressed, preached, and toward the end of the service, I saw Mark in the back of a little makeshift church. He walks in, slips in, sits on the back row, and when it was over, I walked back there with Garfield, and we saw Mark, and his eyes were swollen, like he'd been in a boxing match. Big whelps and bruises all over his arms. I said, Mark, where were you today? And he said, when I went home last night to tell my father I had become a Christian, that I had said yes to Jesus, my father cursed me and said, you are believing a lie. That is the devil's religion. That is the white man's religion. That is a lie. You are no longer my son. He said, my dad took a broom and broke it in half and took the broomstick and beat me with it and tried to kill me with it and hit me in the head and in the face and on the nose and the mouth. And he made me leave the house. And he said, if you ever come back to my house, I will cut your throat because you are no longer my son. You believe the devil white man's religion and you're dead. You are no longer my child. He said, so I spent the night in the woods last night and I start bawling my eyes out because I had read stories about people who paid a cost to say yes to Jesus but I'd never really met someone who had given an unreserved yes like this and I start crying and Garfield starts crying and Mark said but I exact words and the story's in my book amazing encounters he said exact words but I am so thankful that even just a few hours after saying yes to Jesus he found me worthy to suffer for the sake of his name
And there's always a cost. There's always a cost to following Jesus. When I went to India, it was my second or third trip. I've been there multiple times. My wife and I were engaged. We, we took a team of about 20 high school and college students. Our ministry is called Crossroads. And uh, we do student conferences and mission trips. And we have itinerant speakers like me and a year-long discipleship program called CDH. And one of the things that we do are mission trips. And we took a team, and on that team was a 16-year-old girl named Rachel Jones. She was homeschooled. She had just graduated. She grew up in a family with eight brothers and sisters. And she said yes to Jesus. She was already a Christian. When we got to India, we were there for over a month. We served orphans, lepers, pastors, Bible college students. And on the night before we left to come home to America, she said, I have an announcement to make. The Lord has spoken to me. And she was a woman of few words. She worked very hard. She cooked all the meals for all 20 of us, lunch, breakfast, lunch, and supper every single day. Never complained. Never met a girl like her before in my life. She was a woman of very few words. But she said, pray for me. I need to tell you. God's spoken to me, and I've said yes. I'm going to go home to America. I'm going to raise $5,000. I'm going to buy a one-way ticket back here. I'm going to enroll in Bible college. I'm going to learn how to speak Hindi, Malayalam, and Telugu. I'm going to graduate from Indian Bible college. I'm going to marry an Indian pastor. We're going to start an orphanage, a Bible college, a pastor school, and a leper colony. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life preaching the gospel and investing into this nation because this is where God is calling me to do. Guess what she did when she went home? That... She went home and did everything she said she was going to do. And in 2000, my wife and I went to her graduation where she was the number one graduate out of hundreds of Bible college students in India. The very next day, we went to her wedding where she married Amol Pawar. And did you know that in the last 10 years or more that they've been married, they've started a ministry in Nagpur, India. And, and, and the students at our student conference in Gatlinburg and our summer camps in North Carolina for the last 15 years, our students have been giving money every time we have a Crossroads event, and we give all of it to missions, just old school love offerings. Did you know that this past summer at our camps, we saw over 400 students saved, we saw over 300 students surrender to ministry, we raised $41,000 for Rachel and Amol Pawar, and this summer, we crossed the million dollar boundary. Our students at Crossroads events have now given over a million dollars to plant churches, to build leper colonies, to feed orphans. Why? Because one 16-year-old girl said, I'm willing to pay the cost. Yes, Jesus, irreversible, irrevocable, unreserved. Yes. I'm not going to wait for somebody else to come over here and be the impact. I am the impact. You know where you're the impact at? Right where you live. My mission field is wherever I stand. Wherever I sit, wherever I eat, wherever I shop, my, my mission field is wherever this six foot three, 230 pound, ball headed frame happens to be. That's my mission field. So where I go, I am the impact. You don't have to be a Bible college guru or a seminary standout. I am a seminary dropout. Woo! And I'm still the impact. Doesn't matter if you've got a degree, all you got to have is a story. Number two, oh, I'm getting fired up. I'm going to get Pentecostal. I'm going to dance. I swear, I will. And, and then you really will laugh. The cross is a symbol of both death and life. The cross is a symbol of both death and life. On the cross, we see death, the death of God. We see Jesus die. But Jesus did not die for his sake. He died for our sake. The cross was what I deserved. The cross is what you, I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend you, but I want to be a stand-up kind of guy and tell you, you're not that awesome. You're a sinner. God's not mad at you. God doesn't hate you. God loves you. You are made in the image of God. God thinks you are amazing, but you are not perfect. And I'm not either. I'll be the first one to raise my hand and say, I deserve damnation. I deserve it because I'm filthy. I'm rotten to the core without Jesus. Guys, and it's not the things I do that I'm afraid that y'all would judge me for. It's the things I think. I got nothing to hide. 
I don't do a lot of bad things. I don't rape and pillage and plunder and kill, and I hadn't drop kicked a kitten through the plate glass window of a daycare center. I, it's not the things I do. We all want to feel all self-righteous. I haven't done those things. I'm not drinking pot or smoking beer. We all want to get all self-righteous and spiritual and bust your shoulders off, right? Look at me. Guys, listen, it's not the things that we do that damn us. Oftentimes, it's those secret attitudes and thoughts and reactions that nobody sees or knows. The lust, the bitterness, the hate, the violence that we walk around with. You know what Jesus does on the cross? He assassinates the assassin of sin. My favorite TV show of all time, besides Matlock and Dukes of Hazard, was 24. All you need to know is two words, Jack Bauer. Jack Bauer was this highly trained operative, a good guy. And I used to love watching 24 because you'd have all the bad guys, and the bad guys are plotting assassinations. And what they didn't know is that they were being followed by Jack Bauer. The assassins are trying to kill people, but they're about to get assassinated by Jack. Jack Bauer, the man of the hour, the tower of power, too sweet to be sour. <laughs> That's what Jesus does on the cross. On the cross, while Satan's got you in his crosshairs, while Satan's got the target on you, while he's gunning for you, he doesn't even know that Jesus has got him in his crosshairs. Jesus kills death on the cross but the cross is also a symbol of life it's not just death it's life because of the cross I think differently now because of the cross the Spirit of God lives in me and he convicts me when I sin and I have to apologize and repent I had to repent to my kids two days ago because I lost my temper with them and I raised my voice and I had to literally get down on my knees and beg my boys to forgive me I said guys your dad's a sinner I'm a sinner, and by the grace of God, I'm going to do better. And my little, <laughs> my little six-year-old said, that's okay, Daddy. I got, I, got, I got a big bag of candy I've been hiding in the room that y'all don't know about. <laughs> I love that kid. The cross gives us new life. It helps us be able to forgive people who hurt us. I was just in a counseling uh, situation recently for a woman who was sexually molested and abused by her stepdad from the ages of 7 to 11 was able to forgive him. The cross gives life. The cross is God's yes to us. See, we can't say yes to Jesus until Jesus said yes to the cross. We don't choose him, he chooses us. It's not like one day I just decide, I'm going to be a Christian today. No, if Jesus had never made a way for us to be saved by dying on the cross, we couldn't say yes to Jesus. On the cross, Jesus said yes. And let me tell you who he said yes to. And I may go off on this. I don't know. I, I, I might. I might. I can't make any promises. But on the cross, Jesus says yes to straight people and gay people. Jesus says yes to black people and Latinos and Asians and white people, and pasty glow-in-the-dark people like me. On the cross, Jesus says yes to divorced people, single people, victims of rape, women who have had abortions. On the cross, Jesus says yes to liberals, moderates, conservatives. On the cross, Jesus says yes to legal citizens and illegal immigrants. On the cross, Jesus says, I love you all. I love every single one of you. I love you, I love you, but I hate your sin because your sin is hurting you and because I love you, I can't stand to watch you suffer, so I demand that you repent of your sin because your sin's killing you. If I walk in and my kid's drinking poison, I'm going to scream, put it down. If he doesn't put it down, I'm going to go knock it out of his hands. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He knocks the poison out of your hand. Because on the cross, Jesus is saying yes, but he's also saying no. You realize that to say an unreserved yes to Jesus means you've got to say a whole lot of no's to a whole lot of other things. Here's what I mean. 
And I said yes to my wife 13 years, two months, and five days ago. I said yes to her, but I said no to every other woman on the planet. Real women, women in magazines, women on a computer screen. When I said yes to my wife, I said no to pornography. When I said yes to my wife, I said no to women at strip clubs. When I said yes to my wife, I said no to flirting with other women. When I said yes to my wife, I said no to every other option. When we say yes to Jesus, by default, we're saying you're Lord and nothing else is. You're worthy of my life. I will not give my life to anybody else except you, Jesus. And that's a big deal. And before some of you say yes to Jesus today, you need to stop and consider what that means. Because a yes to Jesus is a no to everything else. On the cross, Jesus said no. No, Satan, you will not steal away my children and destroy them. No, death, you're not the final word. No, sin, you will stop ripping my children apart. No criticism, judgment, condemnation, no bitterness, anger, revenge. No, no, no. I bring a new way of life. I bring mercy, grace, forgiveness. I bring life. And death, you will no longer have rule or reign in this world. I'm Jesus. I'm not coming to take sides. I'm coming to take charge. On the cross, Jesus said yes. Now, number three, when we understand the cross, we will do what Jesus tells us to do. We'll say yes. Unreserved, irreversible, irrevocable. When we understand the cross, that I should have died there, that Jesus took my place. When we understand the cross of Christ, it's an automatic yes. Every time. Yes, Jesus, what do you want? You don't even have to tell me what you want. I'm going to go ahead and just say it. Yeah. Yeah. You can have it. I'm yours. It's yours. All that's mine is yours. Past, present, future, resources, money, relationships. It's yours, Jesus. Yes, yes, a thousand times yes. You could say it like this. If we could see what God sees, we would do what God says. If we could see what God sees, we would do what God says. And I feel like right now I need to say this, and I haven't said this in any other service, but I try to, okay, I'll say it. I feel like some of you, your problem is a lot of us. It's my problem too. You just don't really believe that you're loved. You think God's mad. You think God's angry. You think God's out to get you. You think he's been up in heaven keeping a tally of all the evil, wicked, horrible, despicable things you've ever done. And he's just waiting to pounce on you like a wild animal in the, in, in the weeds, waiting on you to walk by. And I just want to say this. If you could understand the amount of love that God poured out for you on the cross, you would not hesitate to say yes. You would sprint to Jesus. You would run with all your might. You would lay everything else down, throw it aside. If we could grasp what John says in 1 John 3, behold, what manner of love the Father has lavished on us that we might be called the sons and daughters of God. And that word lavish means literally poured out in buckets. The cross is God's way of pouring his wrath out on his own son who took our place, but pouring his love out on us because we are now his children and then vindicating the death of his son by raising him from the grave and making him Lord, God, and King. If we could understand the cross, we would automatically say yes every time. Did you know that when Jesus uses this phrase, take up your cross, he's actually referring to something that happened when he was a little boy? This goes back to what I was beginning with. When I wrote my book, Dying to Live, I tell the story about an Indian pastor in that book named Paul Prasad, who, and I don't want to be graphic in, in this story, and I will not be, I want to be very respectful in how I share this and very delicate, but Paul Prasad understood this whole concept of saying yes to Jesus. He was disemboweled for preaching the gospel in New Delhi. An angry mob of religious zealots of another faith 
beat him, broke his bones, and pulled his intestines out of his body. And they thought they killed him, but he survived. And he went back to the same church, to the same spot where they disemboweled him the very next Sunday and preached the gospel. And he preached a message on forgiveness. And one of the men who had disemboweled him stopped him in the middle of the sermon, screamed at the top of his lungs, Stop! Stop! Stop preaching the gospel! And he ran to the front and fell on his knees in front of Paul Prasad and said, Will you please forgive me for what I did to you last week? If your God can forgive a man like me, I must say yes to him. I found out as I was doing the research on what it meant in Mark, Mark 8, 34 for Jesus to say, take up your cross, that when Jesus was a little boy, maybe five or ten years old, there was a rebellion, and it was led by a man named Judas the Galilean. He's only referenced once in the Bible. It's Acts chapter 5, verse 37. He's mentioned. Judas was from the same region Peter was from. He was a zealot. He convinced several thousand of his friends, a thousand or more, we don't really know the exact number, that he was the Messiah. Judas the Galilean said, if you follow me, we'll go kill all the Romans. We'll eradicate their empire. We'll get rid of them. We'll restore the glory of God to Jerusalem. Follow me, you cannot lose. And all of those thousand plus zealots from the northern region of Israel marched with Judas the Galilean into the city of Jerusalem. And they picked a fight that they could not win. The Roman soldiers were trained killers. They defended themselves. They slaughtered dozens and dozens of those zealots. But they decided to make a better point and to use the tool of propaganda, instead of killing them all on the spot, they would simply take them prisoner and they would crucify them on crosses along the main roads leading into the city of Jerusalem. They also decided that after they crucified them, after all those men died, and by the way, it took a man, the average man, two to three days to die of crucifixion. There's one man who lived five days. It's the only one that I've ever read about. They also decide that after these men die, their bodies are going to stay on the crosses until they rot. And once the flesh rots off of their body, they will leave the skeletons hanging on the crosses as a testimony to what happens if you say no to Rome. And so when Jesus was a little boy... All these men are crucified along the streets of Jerusalem. But it's interesting because every one of these zealots who was taken prisoner, they were given a Roman escort. They were given two Roman soldiers to help them to their place of crucifixion. When they crucified people back then, they recycled the wooden beams. So if you were crucified by Roman execution, you weren't crucified on a brand new smooth piece of wood. It was a piece of wood that was caked with human blood, hair, scalp, flesh. You get the picture. And so these Roman soldiers would go get these crosses out of storage. And they would deliver them to these zealots. And the phrase became infamous. The Roman soldier would look at the cross, they would look at the zealot, they would untie their hands, and the Roman soldier would say to that zealot who was caught in the rebellion, take up your cross. And that phrase became well known throughout all of Judea. They would carry their cross to an intersection, a market area, a busy road. When the Roman soldiers felt like this is a good place for you to die, they would say, lay down your cross. And wherever they laid down their cross, that's where they died. Crucified. So why did Jesus use that phrase? See, guys, listen. I'm good at working a crowd. I'm going to be honest with you. You learn how to work a crowd when you preach this long. I can get you to laugh. I can get you to shout, clap, say amen, hoop and holler. I could have you run in the aisles if I wanted to. But the gospel is not about emotion. The gospel is not about good feelings. The gospel is not a pep rally to fire up a bunch of Christians. The gospel is about dying to your sin. 
The gospel is about saying yes to Jesus and taking his life in exchange for yours. The gospel has little to do with how we feel and everything to do with what we choose to believe. And Jesus uses the most offensive, disgusting, scandalous phrase he could have possibly used to say, guys, ladies, if you're going to follow me, one of these crosses may be in your future. And the irony is, 11 out of 12 of his disciples, except for Judas, all ended up losing their lives for the sake of the gospel. Even the apostle John, who died on the island of Patmos, was boiled in hot oil and sent away because he was a follower of Jesus Christ. And he died an old man after writing the book of Revelation. Am I trying to scare you away from Jesus? Nope. I'm trying to tell you the truth. And the truth is, he loves you, and it's serious. He loves you enough to say yes to death. And he loves you enough to extend an invitation to you right now. Say yes to somebody who loves you that much. Father, I want to pray in Jesus' name that your spirit would permeate every soul. Satan, the Lord God, rebuke you and your schemes. Lord, would you remove any spirit of distraction from this room so that every single person who needs to believe in Christ, so that everyone who needs to say yes to Jesus will say it today without hesitation. I want you to keep your eyes closed, please, everybody. But I want your heart to be open. In case you missed it, I'll say it again. God's not mad at you. He loves you. He gave the ultimate sacrifice to save you. He said yes to you and me. With all of our sin and wickedness, he still said yes to us. Now you have to make a choice. If you've never trusted Christ, if you've never said yes to him, you need to say yes to him now. Yes, Jesus, I repent of my sin. Yes, Jesus, I give you control of my life. Yes, Jesus, I put faith in you. Yes, Jesus, I'm all yours. Yes, Jesus, I'm all in. If the Spirit of God has drawn your heart to Christ today and you want to respond to the gospel and you want to be saved, pray this to him right where you sit. Now, you've got to mean it. These words are not magic, and I'm not praying them on your behalf. I'm not a priest. You have to ask Jesus to save you. And you know who you are. And I'm going to tell you how you know if you need to get saved right now. If the Spirit of God has spoken to you, if you feel like everything I've said has been directed at you and you alone, or if your heart feels like it's about to beat out of your chest, that is not your heart beating. That's God's knuckles. Revelation 3.20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and fellowship with them. That is God knocking right now. He wants to know you. He wants you to love him. Say yes to him. Pray this right now if you want to be saved. Right where you sit, quietly in your heart. Pray this to him in your heart. And if you mean it, he'll save you. Pray this to him. Jesus, I need you. Go ahead, pray it to him. Jesus, I need you. Save me from my sin. Rescue me from death. Give me new life. I'm saying yes to you, Jesus. I will follow you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. I'm all yours now. And I'm all in. Help me follow you. I want you to keep your eyes closed. Don't look around. Boldly, deliberately, immediately. If you just prayed those words to Jesus, don't hesitate, don't wait. Right now, if you just prayed those words to Jesus and you meant what you said, I want you quietly, with your eyes still closed, I want you to lift up your hand, straight up above your head right now. Keep it up. Keep it up. Team, go ahead and grab your Bibles. Team, you can look. Keep your hand up. 
we're bringing a Bible to you. We're not going to make you come forward. We're not going to embarrass you. Keep your hand up. Don't put it down. Don't put it down. Raise your hand straight up above your head. Don't put it down. I need to count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34. 35, 36, 37, 38, 39. Praise God. Praise God. Keep your hand up until you get a Bible. Keep your hand up until you get a Bible. Keep your hand up until you get a Bible. <laughs> I love it when we run out of Bibles. Keep your hand up until you get a Bible. Keep your hand up until you get a Bible. Oh, wow. Praise God. 39 people just crossed over from death to life in this house. Anybody else got some way up top? Run to them. Run to them. Back row. Run to them. Come on, Jesus. Have your way. Glory to God. Okay, eyes open. Everybody just look. Who cares? Just look. <laughs> open your eyes. Eyes open, lights on, everybody looking. I, I have not done this all weekend. But I know when God speaks to me. I'm not good at a lot, but I know. I'm going to ask this, and we're not going to do anything theatrical, and we're not going to raise hands. Some of you right here right now, and I, and I believe that among the college and the high school, the middle school students, I believe there's going to be an amazing response to this because of what I've heard about what God's doing here. Some of you, God has been calling you. He's been stirring in your heart, and you know you've been wrestling with it. You've been fighting it. You've been afraid. You've been making excuses. You've been confused. But there are some of you in here. You know it. You know it. You know it. God's calling you into ministry. To be a pastor, a worship leader, a missionary, an evangelist, a children's pastor, a professor at a college, to work among the poor, rescuing people from the sex slave trade. You know, and this is not for everybody, we're all called into ministry. Every one of us is a minister because we're all witnesses to the gospel. But biblically speaking, God in his sovereignty handpicks certain people for certain jobs in his kingdom. Ephesians 4 says he has called some to be apostles and prophets and preachers and teachers and evangelists. So God calls certain people for certain jobs in the kingdom. So with our eyes open and everybody looking and the lights on and nobody singing, I'm just going to ask you right now, spur of the moment, if the Spirit of God has already been dealing with you and you just want to say, yes, unreserved, yes, I'm all in. Jesus, I don't care where you send me. I don't care if I go to China and get locked up. I don't care if I go to a Muslim country and have my head cut off. I don't care if you want me to go to Asbury and be a Bible college professor. Whatever you call me to do, Jesus, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it because you're smarter than me. If that's you right now, I want you. And, and listen, if God's not telling you to do it, don't stand up. It doesn't make you a better Christian because you stand up. We understand? I want you to know what you're doing. If that's you and you want to say, yes, Lord, I know you're calling me into the ministry full time for the rest of my life. And even though I don't know all the details, I'm going to trust you. And so here and now, Lord Jesus, I say yes. If that's you, I want you just to stand up right now. sure he could send you anywhere you could lose your life you could die there could be a cross in your future you might not ever make any money you may never have a house with air conditioning I'm serious you sure anybody else You might as well say yes because he's not going to shut up and leave you alone until you do. He loves you. He wants to use you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven. 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52. 
Anybody else? 53. Jesus said, look at the fields. They're white, ready to be harvested. Pray that the Lord of the harvest would send workers into the fields. 53 workers, 54 workers, 55 workers. Yes, Lord, I'll go into your fields. I'll work among drug addicts. I'll live with the homeless. I'll work wherever you send me. I don't care. Yes. Unreserved. All right, all of y'all that are standing, can you just, just put your hands up? If you got something in your hands, put it down in your seat. I want to lead you in a prayer of confession. Say this out loud. Say this out loud. Lord Jesus, I say yes. I declare my allegiance to you alone. Here I am. Send me. I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. I'll pay any price for your gospel. I'm all in, Jesus, and I'm all yours. Take my life and use it. Jesus, I want to pray right now for every one of these women and every one of these men who have said yes to you. They'll never regret it, and they will change the world for the gospel. Satan, you have lost another multitude to the kingdom of God today that you'll never get back. You lose, devil. By the power of the cross, you lose. And Jesus, you win. Praise God. God, thank you for what you've done today. You receive the glory.